All right, histology. So uh, gonna get us uh, started on this here. So again, histology, just to remind everybody, is the study of tissues. And that's what we're gonna be looking at throughout the semester here. Uh, for those of you that have had A&P before, this is kind of like the early on in A&P when we get to the tissues chapter. Uh, this kind of a uh, little bit more in-depth version of that. So what we're gonna be doing is kind of starting out talking about the first couple chapters here are gonna be really about overall what is the study of histology and what are some key things about how we would get to the slides to study histology. So that's what this first one's gonna be is a little bit about how when you're gonna study tissues, what you have to do to actually get these tissues that you can look at them. Uh, then throughout the semester after that, after we get through that and then talk about just kind of basic cell structure, we are gonna work our way through the different tissue types and then not all the body systems, but a good number of them, we're gonna go through body system by body system and talk about kind of some of the key parts of that system and how to identify them histologically. Uh, so we're gonna be doing this with a lot of different videos like this. At the end of a lot of these videos, I will also take something with a digital slide. This first week's worth here is not gonna be that way or first, uh, four episodes here. We really won't be looking at slides much, but after that, when we get into the different tissues, I will actually, on the tail end of each of these, get digital slides and then show you that. Because we're doing this online, that is how we are gonna do a lot of this. We're gonna be looking at digital slides that are on a number of different websites. It'll be on the Moodle page and we'll look at them that way. So histology, again, this is the study of tissues. So why study this? It allows us to kind of understand how our cells, how our tissues, our organs are structured uh, and to be able to kind of put that together with what they look like microscopically. Uh, this is kind of part of one of those levels of anatomy. And to me, it's kind of a neat one. Generally, when we do this one, uh, it's usually not having to be online all the time here. Uh, when you kind of do it in person, there is a lot more working with the scopes, and this is one of those classes that really gets you understanding how and the correct ways to use a microscope. Uh, obviously, with the online, we'll be looking at digital slides and doing some of it that way, but it is still a pretty neat, it's a pretty neat course. Uh, so, again, where does this fit in? It's kind of beneath that level of gross anatomy. So, gross anatomy, if I was to take in, like, okay, here's the hand, here's this finger, this finger, this, da, 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 da. that would be gross anatomy. It's something you can see with the naked eye. We're going just beneath that to the microscopic anatomy and looking at the tissue structure. Uh, so that would be histology. Uh, it's one of those levels of micro, uh, excuse me, of uh, microscopic anatomy. Uh, you could go further than that, look at cytology, looking at some of the different types of scopes, allowing us to get a little bit smaller. Uh, but again, this is kind of fits in. It's one of the basis of, for a lot of things in physiology. Uh, you do some similar stuff in microbiology. And if you were ever to go and study pathology, we're going to be looking at normal tissue uh, structure and kind of what it looks like identification where pathology a lot of times would be looking at what should be normal tissue and determining what has changed in it and what that means to that particular person. So well, some of the stuff we need to kind of figure out before we get going too far on this is really where do we get these tissues from? So. For studying histology, it is actually a number of different species. It's not always human. Uh, every once in a while we get slides that are human, uh, but a lot of them are going to be other animals that have similar tissue types in there. Uh, generally, what you're going to be doing when you get a lot of this here, especially if they were doing something in a lab and making a slide out of this, you're going to be taking a fresh specimen and then either doing something with that fresh specimen to take a look at it or preserving it in something so we can take a look at it at a later time. And that ends up being one of the big things with uh, making a tissue slide is these are, or at least were, living tissues. Uh, because of that, they are prone to degradation. So what we need to do one way or the other is make it so they're not gonna break down. Uh, and that requires us to do a number of different things with this. So generally, you're gonna get these tissues, either fresh tissues or something preserved in formalin. Formalin is kind of a diluted form of uh, formaldehyde, and that is what we refer to as a fixative. So it's something that's going to actually make it so this stuff cannot be uh, degraded. You're not going to get a bacteria breaking it down and uh, converting it to just rotten tissue. 
So that is a big part of this. And one of the things we do in this first chapter is talk a lot about how would we actually go in about getting a histological specimen. Uh, like I said, there is a lot involved in this. It's not something we actually usually do in this class, but I want you to understand how uh, the slides that we would look at or the digitized slides that we end up looking at, how they would get to where we can look at them. Because a lot of times what it means is there's been some change sometimes. So certain tissues like the skin, for example, certain layers of it wouldn't look the way they do under the microscope if it was fresh tissue, but because of how we prepared it, sometimes this will introduce artifacts and certain structural things that you see because of how we prepared this. Uh, so preparing histological specimens, really what we need to do is get these tissues to where we can actually look at them. And a big part of this is actually this idea of fixation. Uh, it's a chemical reaction here that is really taking this and preventing the material, whatever we're going to be looking at, from breaking down. So, so it doesn't break itself down through autolysis, so bacteria don't attack it and break it down. And ideally, we want whatever we're doing is this fixation to maintain its basic structure, its shape, its volume, not cause major changes to the cell. And again, what we want this also to be able to do is we don't want it to do something to this tissue so much that it's not going to allow us to look at this or stain it with certain uh, stains to allow us to look at this. So ideally, whatever we're doing here is going to leave this tissue as close to what it looked like in life as it does when we fix this. And again, it's this, whatever the fixative is here is working together with what's in these tissues to make, it's really working together with the living tissue to make this gel that keeps everything in its kind of relationship to where it was in life. Again, a lot of things can influence this. Again, we're not doing this in class, uh, especially this year, uh, but a number of things do play a role in this. And these are all things, if a slide wasn't good, these are, could be reasons why. So pH is important and when you're prepping this one, the particular temperature of the tissues is important. Some of the biggest issues with this is actually getting good penetration of that fixative into the tissues. A lot of times it'll penetrate in the outside, but if you don't leave it in there long enough, the inner part will not get enough fixative to it and then that will break down. Uh, so a lot of times that means getting these sizes you're gonna fix into a small enough piece that this stuff can all get in there. And there's a number of different fixatives. Uh, some work better than others and some are good for certain types of stains and not for others. Some allow you to do different types of immuno staining, other ones would not allow that. Uh, and depending on what you're trying to look at, certain fixatives might be better than others. Uh, probably the most commonly used ones that I would say that maybe keep it in mind here. And again, I'm not going to give you something and say, how would you make uh, a slide out of this? What would you use as a fixative and all that? We're not going to do that in here. We're not going to be actually learning the exact process and what you would do with a particular tissue type. What we are doing is kind of giving you a broad overview of how we would make some of these slides and what are some examples of some of these fixatives. So again, the ones that are kind of most commonly used tend to be formaldehyde or formalin. Uh, that is a diluted form of formaldehyde. Those are probably your most common fixative. Uh, outside of that, ethanol is another big one. Ethanol, methanol, the alcohols are pretty commonly used. The other stuff, a little bit fewer and far between. Uh, I have looked at stuff with picric acid before. That one's a very dangerous one, honestly. The crystals of that are quite explosive, so you got to be careful when you make those ones. Uh, not something we would do in one of our labs here, even if we were trying to do this. That's something a lot of people would send out somewhere because, like I said, it's a quite dangerous actual chemical. So... Once we get that done and we fix this, a lot of times it means we're getting, we have to get this prepared so we can look at it. So if you have a, I don't know, here's a, it's a chapstick. But this, let's say this was a hunk of tissue. You can see it's wide around and stuff like that. We cannot put this on a microscope slide if we're gonna be looking at a cross section of this. Uh, Again, to look at stuff and have light pass through something on a microscope, you need to be able to get thin sections. In order to do that, we have to change what that tissue is. Because if you think about a lot of these tissues, if you were to try to slice it, it's kind of like really not particularly well-cooked bread. You're going to slice into it and it's just going to go and squish down. 
So what we need to do is we need to get these tissues in a condition that is going to be good for doing these really thin slices of this. Uh, so we can section it. So we want it soft enough that we can cut it, but not so soft that it squishes down, hard enough that it will maintain its positions, but not so hard it damages the knife or tissue. Uh, because of that, we need to do some different things once we've fixed this. And a lot of this is, again, water is not something that's going to give us the ability to really slice through this really well unless we freeze it. And that is something that happens every once in a while they will sometimes work with frozen tissue and a lot of what we're talking about here you do that a little bit different with frozen tissue uh, again but that's something you have to stain and it's not something that's going to maintain a long period of time if we're doing slides like we have in the AMP lab that have been there for the 10 years ish more than I've been here even uh, you need to do some other stuff to these ones that are going to maintain a little longer so a lot of times what this means is actually getting the material that's in there out. So a lot of that water that's gonna be making up most of the tissue, it's not gonna be good for stains, it's not good for preventing bacterial from breaking it, bacteria from breaking it down. So a lot of times what we have to do on this is we have to dehydrate this, then put some type of uh, organic solvent in there to clear it, where we can then replace that organic solvent with something, in this case here, it's gonna be wax, in most cases paraffin, that we can then slice. So that is this, this three-stage process of dehydrating, clearing it, and then embedding it. So dehydration, and I've actually done the stuff in the lab. So as in my grad school work, I did a lot of making tissue sections out of mouse mammary glands or actually human samples even. Uh, a lot of times it's gonna be, you have to put, the, after you fix this tissue, put it in formalin, let it sit there for a day or two or whatever else like that. You're then gonna remove this out in this fixed tissue you're going to try to dehydrate it get the water out and replace it with something that we can get wax into its place the main thing is paraffin and water do not mix it's like taking candle wax as paraffin if you drop candle wax on the water they're not going to mix so what we need to do is we need to get the water out of these uh, in order to do this you actually start replacing it with different concentrations of ethanol so to minimize this we start going with moderate levels of alcohol and we'll work our way up so generally with like a paraffin wax method you start it in like a 60 percent 70 percent ethanol solution then it does an hour and that one goes to one that's a little bit higher concentration an hour and that one and you work your way up until you're in pretty much 95 percent or more ethanol we can then go to some other type of clearing agent and then paraffin so these dehydration alcohol is usually alcohol. I would say most of the time it's ethanol. You can use methanol, you can use acetone, but generally it's ethanol. And you try to keep these in a consistent size, small enough that the stuff can penetrate in. And you're going, it's usually 30 minutes to an hour in each, each of these different concentrations, working your way up and until you can get it to this higher level of alcohol where you've really removed most of the water and you have just alcohol in there. You're then going to use some type of clearing agent. So this is something that is can mix well with that dehydrated agent, which is alcohol, as well as something that can allow the whatever we're embedding this in, which in this case is going to be paraffin wax, is something that can kind of mix with either of those ones. So again, it depends on what you're using here, but again, you want the clearing agent. Uh, depends on the type of tissue, type of tissue processor, obviously safety factors, other things like that are going to be in there. Uh, how it works with molten paraffin wax and things that aren't going to damage the tissue. A lot of these clearing agents are going to be these kind of uh, organic solvents. Uh, probably the two most common, I would say, are xylene. So either spelled this way, as you can see it right here, X, Y, L, E, N, E. Xylene and toluene are generally the two most common types on these ones. So uh, we worked with xylene in our lab when I was a graduate student. So what you do is you go through these different alcohol solutions and then you go into a xylene solution, another xylene solution, and then you do a mix of paraffin wax, which will dissolve in this xylene. You do a mix of that and then finally into a molten type of paraffin, which can get in there and serve for that embedding. 
Again, there's obviously other things that can be used. Chloroform, as you can see, has its issues. Uh, then you're going to uh, go with embedding. So in this case, you're going to be taking that and uh, you put this into that pair, of the, uh, the stuff that's went into this solvent. It's then going to go into this paraffin wax. And what this will do is allow it to harden up like a candle would. Uh, paraffin, again, is what candles are made out of. It's wax. It is liquid at certain temperatures, but at room temperature is generally solid. But again, with this candle wax, you can get these thin ribbons of this, which will allow us to be able to cut it very thin. And using this allows us to get these nice little thin ribbons of this stuff, which can then be put into a water bath and we can get these onto a slide nice and easy. Uh, there's certain things I've done with paraffin wax to make it better for histology. So they've done things to make it so it makes nice little ribbons better, uh, makes it a little bit so it hardens up a little bit better. Uh, but again, this is what we're doing on this one. Uh, we don't want this wax to have the clearing agent in there. We don't want dust particles to be in there. But what we really do then is after you get wax into the tissue, this paraffin wax into the tissue, you're then going to cool it down on usually a cold plate and that'll let this wax harden up and not give you a big crystal size so it'll cut nice. So sometimes you use a machine like this. So this one actually has a wax reservoir and all this other stuff here on this one. Uh, we had almost like a, it looked like a coffee maker that you could take wax out of on it. Uh, this is a little bit higher end on this one. But you have something that's keeping that wax warm you can get that embedded sample in there and then you put it on the cooling plate which will solidify that wax and hold that in place so a lot of times you're using these little cassettes that sometimes will act as like the block for slicing as well but you can see a cassette like this you put the sample in here uh it's gonna be on like a little metal plate underneath it you put the thing in there put a little bit of wax on this put this on there and then run wax through this part right here so then it holds the block and everything together and sometimes these little cassettes are also used with doing the fixation. You just take one side of it off to make the particular uh, the block that you're going to be sectioning with. When you get done, you can see something like this. So like this was that metal thing I was talking about. This would be set on the cold plate. You put the tissue sample right in here that's been embedded in the wax. And I'll show you the machine and the picture here in just a second. But you put the little sample in here, put a little molten wax around it. You'll then set this little plastic cassette on top of this and run wax through that so you fill it up with wax and then it has the plastic right within the wax you harden that all up and then you have as you can oh sorry as you can see on this one you can see the specimen within the wax right here and that is what's going to allow us to take then a microtome which you can kind of see in the back corner of the picture right here this has a super super fine blade on it and this lets you do these really thin sections of like 10 microns so this is a microtome. So what you do is you get that block in there, you trim the block a little bit, and then what you can do is there's a little crank arm on that. It goes and every spin is gonna move it forward just a little bit so it does these consistent thin slices, which you can then get the wax to ribbon like this. What you then do is you put that onto a, into a water, warm water bath. So you put it onto a warm water bath. Let's say this was a little water bath like this. You'd have it set in the sample here and then you take the slide, dip it underneath the water, and you come back up underneath and that's how you can get it onto the slide. At that point, you're ready to actually do staining and other stuff like that with this. So microtomes are showing a couple examples here. Like I said, have these really fine, super, super sharp knives. Uh, I mean, we're saying really sharp knives on this one. Uh, they were notorious in the... Anytime we had a, uh, was when I was a graduate student at Michigan State University, anytime we had an undergrad in there, it seemed like every time any of them worked with the microtome, we'd always say, don't touch the blade, don't be, you have to be really careful around the blade. I want to say pretty much every undergrad we had in there when I was there managed to cut themselves on it. A uh, couple of the other graduate students managed to cut themselves on it. I never did cut myself on a microtome, but they super sharp blades. It, you would cut yourself without even realizing you did it. Uh, but again, they're very consistent. Every time you kind of rotate that thing, it's going to slide forward just a little bit and it gives you this consistent slice that is thin enough again to pass light through. Uh, like I said, we mar put it on a microscope slide after you put it in a water bath. You reach underneath and lift it up and then it's on the slide. 
things that are super water rich that you don't want to damage or you can't put through that uh, uh, fixing technique. You can do cryo sectioning. Uh, this is you have this freezer. It's a it basically has a microtome within a frozen area here. Certain types of antibody staining will not let you use uh, formalin fixed samples. So every once in a while you are going to do cryo sections. You can also stain a lot quicker with these ones. It's less time, so a lot of uh, hospital labs are going to use more cryo section. But you freeze these into this freezing tissue and you can make a slide within about five minutes versus the process I was talking about, you're looking at about a day. Uh, so like it says there, about 16 hours to go through that. So, and again, you can do a lot of antibody staining a little bit easier with this one. Uh, we freeze the tissue, doesn't change it as much as a fixative would. But again, if you want something to last longer, you are going to have to use a fixative. Other types of microscope, mic Microscopy, sorry. Uh, you do have slightly different things when you're looking at electron microscopy. This is needing a much sharper knife because there is going to be some gold embedding. They have what they call an ultra microtome and it's using a diamond knife to cut these sections or a glass knife to cut these sections versus a metal one. Uh, when you start talking about botanicals, you use a different type of microtome because things like wood and bone do not slice particularly easy with a metal knife. Uh, so those things you're going to be using something a little bit different. Again, super, super sharp. Like I said, most people I know that worked with this stuff have cut themselves on a microtome at one point or another. It's, it was it's not funny because some of them can be really nasty cuts, like deep, but uh, they are super, super sharp. But again, once you get these those little slices, you can then put them in a water bath like it's shown here. You take that slide, you dip it underneath, and you lift it up and try not to have it fold or anything else like that. And that's how you get those samples onto a slide. And at that point, you can start doing the staining or whatever else you're going to do with the slides at that point. So you stain them. You then put a cover slip on them with a different type of mounting medium depending on what you're doing with it. And slides can last depending on how you've done that from weeks or months to decades in some cases. I'm pretty sure in the AMP lab there is some slides that have been in there 30, 40 years it looks like at this point. But at that point you can then take them on the microscope and take a look at them. So this is pretty much like the machine I worked with here. So when you do that uh, processing that I was talking about here through the different types of alcohol solutions, there's going to be a lot of times to be a machine like this. This is a more mechanical one. They're getting a lot more digital at this point where you can set the times and change the times. Mine had a dial with little pins that would go around it. But the main thing is you have a basket that goes in one of these. This whole apparatus up here lifts up, moves it over to the next one, and then it will work its way around and do that processing. So machine processing is ideally what you want to do. You can do manual processing. But again, it's a 16-hour process. A lot of times there's an hour in this, an hour in this, an hour in this, where... With machine processing, a lot of times what you would do is you would set this up at the end of the day, do the tissue processing, get it in the processor, and then through that night, it would be done. So about noon the next day, you were ready to start embedding and doing that type of stuff with it. But again, this is just giving you an idea of how these slides that you've looked at before in your life, or if we were actually doing this in person in class, how you'd be looking at these slides here. This gives you an idea of how they got to that point. The digitized slides we're going to look at, those were real slides that were actually taken and done this way. So it gives you an idea of what those digitized slides we're looking at are, how they came to be as well. And again, this just kind of shows you that comparison of paraffin versus cryostat. Cryostat's a lot quicker. Uh, you might do a short fixation on this one, but again, it's pretty, pretty quick where... The procedure with paraffin slides, like I said, what's on this side here with the staining and everything else like that, you're probably looking at a two-day process. One day to prep the sample and get it ready for slicing, then another day to do the staining to get it through that process. So you can kind of see why in certain instances, like when they're removing the tumor in the lab and they want to know something about it real quick, why you would do cryostat and frozen tissue versus these paraffin slides. If you have a little bit longer, paraffin slides are going to last longer. They are going to maintain better, but they are a much longer process to prep them and get them ready to look at. 
So that gives us the idea kind of about that, uh, how we prep these ones. The other little one on this intro here is going to talk a lot about the microscope and how we prepare, uh, how we stain and why we would stain and what are some different examples of stain. Uh, again, just introducing these ideas and why we do them. Uh, again, we're not going to get into would you stain this type of tissue with which type of stain. We're not going to go into that type of stuff. This again is all about just kind of introducing you to how we would get the slides and what the process is for those ones without getting too crazy into the nitty gritty about how would you make your own slide. Again, it's an introduction to histology, not histology methods course. So that's why we're just kind of doing the introduction here. So I will see all of you next time.